So my name is Matt Kreit, and I'm a teaching and learning specialist here at CTRL. I use they, them pronouns, and I'll be the moderator of our panel today. And so uh, you'll get a chance to hear from our uh, panelists and uh, their brief introductions when we get to the, the panelist portion. Um, but just so you know, our panelists today are uh, Nicole and Gotti, Valentina Aquila, uh, Adam Tomaszewski, and San, uh, Santiago Toledo. And um, I'm sure they have some really great uh, insights to share with you. And I hope that you all get a lot out of this session. Uh, what we hope that you get out of the session are the ability to reflect on the ways in which alternative grading practices contribute to creating, creating inclusive and equitable learning environments. And then identify some potential barriers, which you may even have in your mind of uh, reasons why or, or challenges that you may have related to implementing these types of alternative grading practices. And hopefully our panelists will be able to share some strategies that you can use to overcome those barriers. We'll also get a chance to kind of, um, to, for you all to uh, share any of those barriers and maybe ask them as questions if you, if you need specific help. So our outline today um, is we'll start with just a brief poll as a warm up uh, to get your all's experiences with alternative grading. And I'll launch that in just a moment. Um, then I'll do just a really brief overview of alternative grading to get everybody on the same page in case some folks are not familiar with some of the terminology that we'll be using today. Then we'll go into a short uh, a section where I've prepared some questions for our panelists, and then we'll move into an audience Q&A towards the end. So we'll start with our audience experiences with alternative grading. So I promised a poll and I uh, just launched it. So you should get a notification to respond to three multiple choice questions um, as a part of this poll. So go ahead and respond and then I'll share the, um, those responses with you all once we've gotten a uh, quorum. just in 20, 30 more seconds uh, to respond to that uh, poll. All right, great. So we got about 75% participation. So that's about 21 of you all. And I am sharing the results right now. So you should be able to see those on your screen. So the vast majority of folks in our room have not taught a course uh, that uses alternative grading. Um, and a few people aren't sure. So hopefully we'll be able to illuminate whether or not you use those uh, practices in your courses. Uh, most people are falling somewhere within this somewhat to not confident uh, interval um, in terms of how uh, comfortable or confident you are in using alternative grading practices in your course. And hopefully through the session today, you'll be able to gain some more confidence um, and become a little bit more familiar with the ways that you could actually use these uh, practices in your class. And then finally, um, we have a few, some folks that uh, have a class in mind. So about 50% of people have a class in mind that they'd like to teach, uh, use alternative grading practices in. And then our other half are don't, either don't have a class in mind or are still kind of thinking about it. So as you're hearing these uh, perspectives from our panelists today and all of the information that we share, try to keep in mind if there is a class that this would fit for you, um, for you to incorporate. And we'd always love uh, to chat about that and I'll share some ways that you can connect with us uh, after this panel uh, if you do need additional assistance. So I'm gonna go ahead and stop sharing our poll results right now and move into just that brief overview of alternative grading. So what I'm gonna start with is this question, are grades a good measure of student learning? And so you may hear some people say, well, grades are great, they're effective, they're simple, they're adaptable. We can use them in lots of different courses, right? You can get an A in a math class, you can get an A in an English class, but what does that really mean, right? Are grades effective at serving the purposes that we, uh, that we set out for them? And the answer is maybe. Um, but we would argue that a lot of times grades don't really fulfill the purposes that we have for them. So criteria can vary pretty widely 
in terms of what you use to determine a student's grade. So some people use effort, some people use achievement or mastery. Some people use various behaviors like turning something in on time. That's not really related to the material that students are learning, but it's related to the behaviors that students are doing. So is that telling you whether or not they achieved your learning outcomes? Um, grading can be subject to bias, uh, such as the halo bias, which suggests that a, um, a positive impression of a student can increase a letter grade up to about uh, half of a letter grade. So if you see a student positively, just implicitly, without really meaning to, you can increase that student's grade up to half of a letter grade, even though you're trying to be uh, equitable and inclusive with your grading practices. Or implicit bias, um, this idea that we have some implicit biases that we're not really uh, always sure of or always aware of. Um, and there are some studies uh, that I've linked here that I'll share with you um, as a resource uh, when I follow up with the slides. Um, but this study that I'm referencing had teachers evaluate writing. Um, so the same writing sample, um, and one was associated with a black student's name and one was associated with a white student's name. And the uh, instructors graded that black student more harshly, even though the writing sample was exactly the same. Um, typically, uh, people will see grades as the signal as the end of the learning process, so not the beginning. So receiving a grade can make students less likely to incorporate feedback. Um, so what they may say or what they may think is, oh, well, I got an A, why would I care about the feedback? Or if I got a lower grade, well, I already turned it in and there's nothing I can really do about it. Why would I care about that feedback? So when students get grades or a very definitive grade, they may not recognize that they still, that learning is still a process and that they're still on that learning journey. Uh, finally, grades can decrease students' intrinsic motivation and enjoyment of learning. So studies show how when uh, folks start to get paid for something, they tend to not enjoy it as much. And you may have noticed that as well in your own life. Think about some of the things that you really enjoy as a hobby and how that might change if you're required to do that. Um, or when you're, you have that extrinsic motivation trying to get you to do that particular uh, hobby. That's not to say that this will occur for all students, um, but it does uh, happen for some of our students. So a general summary is that rather than stimulating an interest in learning, grades uh, primarily enhance students' motivation to avoid receiving bad grades. So what are our options, right? There are some alternative grading uh, systems that are really important to talk about and that we could potentially use in our courses. But uh, what all of these grading systems do is they purposefully eliminate or minimize the use of points or letter grades to assess students. So instead, we're gonna focus on self-reflection and metacognition and the idea that learning is a process. So that there's no real end to it. We're always learning more. They're always incorporating uh, new information into your uh, knowledge systems. Alternative grading systems also support mastery and that students take that feedback more seriously because they can apply it as they move throughout the course. They can increase student agency and empower students because they have more information about what they need to do to, um, to master the course learning outcomes, and they can increase clarity and transparency around the evaluative process. So some of the options that you'll hear us uh, talk about today are ungrading, which is kind of a, can either be used as a broad term for all of these different types of grading, or sometimes it refers to a very specific system where there are no grades at all, and all uh, grade or any sort of evaluation that needs to be done is done via conversation between the student and instructor. Um, a lot of our panelists use contract grading or labor-based grading, uh, which is, as it says, you set out a grading contract that outlines what you need to do to get an A, B, C, and then students know what they need to do. Specifications grading is similar, um, but can be less uh, labor-based in that students need to be able to achieve a particular learning goal, and then you have assignments associated with that learning goal. But again, it lays out exactly what students need to do to get particular grades. And then finally, portfolio-based grading is another um, format that you may see and is one of the types that uh, students develop portfolios of their work over the course of a semester or year or portion of a semester and then receive feedback on that, um, uh, on that portfolio. And what I'll do right now is share a link to a resource in the chat um, about alternative grading practices that provide you with a lot more information about these different practices and some references that you can use to see actual examples of how other folks have implemented these in their classroom. 
So what we're going to do now, so that's our brief overview of alternative grading. Like I said, it's very brief um, so that we can leave the most time possible for our panelists. So we're going to move into our panelists prepared questions portion. Um, what I'm going to do now is stop sharing my slides. I'm going to pin our panelists up at the top. I guess I'll pin myself as well um, so that you all have us on your screen. And then I'm going to start with our first prepared question. And I will be putting these questions in the chat in case anyone um, is uh, jumps in or misses out and needs to reference back what, uh, what we're supposed to be at, uh, answering. So our first question today is, could each of you briefly introduce yourselves and share your background and alternative grading practices? And I think um, just based on where you are on my screen, we'll start with Nicole. Okay, great. Thank you so much, Mac. And thank you all for being here. This is really, uh, really exciting. And um, I'm delighted to have been invited to be here. So I'm Nicole Angadi. I'm an associate professor of sociology. Um, I'm also the associate director of the Center on Health Risk and Society. And um, I would say I'm, you know, fairly new to alternative grading practices. I uh, attended a CTRL sponsored workshop in December, uh, two years ago in 21 that Adam, one of the panelists uh, ran, um, which sort of, I, I, I came to with, with, I was very intrigued um, by, by this idea of going gradeless, which was the title of the presentation. And, um, and so, since that time, I've now um, adopted um, gradeless techniques into my syllabi. So I have so far three undergraduate courses and one graduate course for which I've um, adopted, um, I guess, I, in the labor-based or contract-based grading. But I also think that I've incorporated some elements of specifications-based grading as well into that. And we can talk more about what that looks like uh, with the other questions. Thanks, Nicole. Um, Adam, you want to go next? Sure. Hey, everybody. Uh, I'm Adam Tempshasky. I pronouns are he, him. Um, with the Ryan Studies Program, I've been here at AU since 2004. Um, and for the last two years, I've been faculty director of the Complex Problems Program in the University College. I've been doing ungrading, specifically labor-based grading, since fall 2019. Um, we'll talk more about, you know, I saw how I came to that, but that's that's been my experience thus far. So I've got a few semesters, not a gazillion, but I've got a few semesters under my belt with it. Um, and I'm pretty much in the labor-based world, though I'm kind of flirting across the bar with the specs version, perhaps. Maybe we'll see how things go. Um, but I think one of the things that will come out from this, this session is that there is no one single system within the different possibilities. There are permutations. And um, I feel like most of my colleagues and I have discovered it's an ongoing um, pedagogical investigation. When you, when you start pulling that one thread, a lot of threads come with it. Um, and we'll be talking about some of those today. So I'm, I'm really happy to be with you all. Thanks, Adam. Uh, Valentina? Uh, hello, everybody. I'm Valentina Aquila. I'm an assistant professor in environmental science. And I have a kind of little experience with um, with labor based grade, labor based grading in my in my uh, case. So I started uh, two semesters ago um, because I was teaching a complex problem class, and I was feeling really unsatisfied by how I was grading my students. I didn't feel that the grades were reflecting whether they were learning or not. And especially for essays, like I'm not a native English speaker and a lot of the students don't write particularly well, but I don't teach them how to write because I'm a science um, professor. And so um, I was feeling really uncomfortable. So I started talking with, uh, with Adam and he told me, hey, have you ever heard about <laughs> this concept? I think Adam initiated it from, for everybody. <laughs> Have you ever heard about this concept? So I talked more with him and I first implemented it two semesters ago in just a couple of assignments in my complex problem class. And then last semester, my whole two, both my classes were uh, labor-based uh, graded. And one was again, the complex problem class. And the other one instead was a, 
an upper level 400 600 level climatology class so a mainly content focus uh, uh science class um and yeah i don't have a lot of experience but i'm happy to share what i've learned in this semester thanks valentina i think the key uh something that i just want to pull out of what you just said is that you started with just implementing it in a few spots in your class and that is an option for our participants today so you don't have to go fully all the way in if it's uh it's it can be very overwhelming um to start fully just like going straight into alternative grading practices so you can just start with just one or two assignments to see how it works for your students um so thank you for bringing that up Valentina. uh and then santiago hi everybody i'm santiago toledo an associate professor here in the department of chemistry um i'm so glad to be here it's wonderful to be with everybody interested in this idea um, I've been doing alternative grading practices uh, since around 2015. I've implemented um, these practices in courses uh, from 100 level to 400 level, um, as well as implementations in um, general chemistry laboratories, so introductory level uh, laboratories as well. So I've, I've supported some of that work, um, and I love it. And once I got started, I could not go back. So it's it's one of those things, and I think I agree with Adam, that once you start pulling on a thread then kind of things unravel um, uh, all the way. So yeah, I'm excited to be here and looking forward to hearing your questions. Awesome, thank you all for introducing yourself. I think we'll, um, I love all of your backgrounds. I love all of your perspectives and I think this will be really great. Um, so my, my second question is what inspired you to use alternative creating practices in your courses? Um, and we'll start this one off with Nicole. Great, thanks. So the short answer to what um, you know, what led me to get started with uh, these uh, gradeless approaches is simply dread. <laughs> like I absolutely dreaded the end of the semester when I was faced with you know sort of finalizing grades, if you will. I dreaded various points in the semester where I had to evaluate student work, and I was constantly questioning myself. Um, and wondering, um, you know, am I being equitable? Uh, am I, you know, am I introducing these very sort of implicit biases that Mac was referring to um, into my into my, you know, a grading of individual students? And so, um, it really for me, um, this dread really removed the joy from teaching. And so when I um, attended the the going gradeless talk that Adam gave in that um, you know a couple of years ago, one of the questions that that Adam asked of us is you know what do we pardon me if I got these questions wrong Adam but it was something along the lines of you know what do we enjoy most and least about about teaching, and you know the the short answers for what I enjoy most was engaging with watching students learn right and and watching students really engage with the process of learning and of course what i enjoyed least was what i just said was was this dread so being able to uh find have the sort of science and data that backed that i wasn't alone in in my dread of grading that this is actually uh, one of the most common responses that teachers will give to what they you know dislike most about teaching is grading right um, so learning how it is that I can sort of separate the learning process from this um, from this kind of almost arbitrary, um, you know, assignment of a grade was really intriguing for me. And so I've since now, um, you know, been sort of diving in and learning more about how to kind of implement these types of practices and it, and the return for me, and I think the return for students in terms of engagement with learning and enjoyment with learning has been tremendous. And yes, so I will stop there. Thanks so much, Nicole. I think you brought up some really great points. Um, and I think especially the, the separating the learning process from the assigning of the grade feels really key to what a lot of people experience when we come to alternative grading is that the learning process isn't really always encompassed in that grade that we're giving our students. Um, so I really appreciate you bringing up that point. Um, does anybody else wanna jump in for this question? Uh, I can jump in my well let's start with this so um, I've been like I said in writing studies since 2004 and in spring of 2019 
Um, the Writing Studies Program uh, worked with, I think, with the other couple campus partners to bring a Sao in away um, in as part of anti racist pedagogy uh, day of workshops. And, you know, I don't know if any of you have seen Gross Point Blank, if that movie is still in the zeitgeist at all. But there's a line in that where Minnie Driver's character talks about getting, I forget the exact words, like shakabuku. And like she describes it as the swift spiritual kick to the head. Um, and when I think about what Asao Inoue did for me, and essentially what it came down to was, and part of me is like, God, I'm embarrassed to admit this, but if you say embarrassing things, they tend to be true things, right? Asao Inoue made the point, which in hindsight to me is like, oh, that's wildly obvious now, but it had never, I never interrogated it that using uh, your traditional letter-based grading system in a writing class, this was focused on anti-racism and writing in particular, using that, that letter-based system was holding students up to, to white language, right? It was one of the ways that white supremacy reinforces and continues itself by saying to students, oh, there is a right language and your adherence to it will determine your grade. And that, that was this, this, this spiritual kick to the head. It, it completely changed uh, my world, and there's a line from Rilke, which I actually put in my original Going Grayless presentation, it came back to me just now, so it must be really important to me. There's a line from one of Rilke's poems, I think the Torso of Apollo, uh, that ends with, you know, you must change your life. And a sow in no way sort of opening my eyes to the way that I had been partaking and furthering the system of, of linguistic white supremacy, it just, it, I, I couldn't go back. That was the last semester I could use grades in my writing class. Um, and though, yes, you absolutely can make small moves. My personality, as my family will tell you, is to go all in once, once something comes my way. So uh, there was no middle ground. It was spring, I had this awakening, and in fall, I was using my first labor-based system. Um, and after a year in my writing classes, I brought it over to my complex problems courses. Uh, it's in my creative writing courses. I, I can truly not imagine ever teaching a class with, with traditional grading, again, knowing the toxicity of grades, the negative impact on learning, the way that it fuels students' anxieties. Um, and all that started with the Sao Inoue. And so he really, for me, uh, would be like my origin story. That that day in spring 2019, that, that's how I came to it. And um, I'm definitely still in it, still very much a beginner, a learner. And, and I hope I always feel that way because there's amazing colleagues here that have opened my eyes to new ideas and, and new things of doing. Um, so yeah, there's my my quick-ish background. If I can add something, sure. um, my my what really pushed me to find a different way of grading was the fact that, um, well, I asked myself, what was I really grading? Like what was, what were my, gra my gradient reflecting? And what I more and more realized is that they were not always actually often they were not reflecting how much they were learning and the students were learning but mostly how much they have learned to 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 kind of game the system to get the best the best possible grade and no matter how much i would change my assignment so that they would really show up it uh, would really verify an actual learning um they would always find a way to not do really what i wanted them to do but still get 100% and um, I mean, maybe this says something about me and how I plan my assignment. But for instance, I had I have them work in groups also for like, I don't really have tests, but for having class, in class assignment, I have them work in groups because I think it's helpful for everybody. I don't have to. I mean, you're all I bet on board with, uh, with the value of working in group. And then I also have to I have them resubmit like I do multiple choices and numerical exercises. They do it once and then they can resubmit it once or twice. Uh, yeah, once or twice generally. Uh, that's what I was doing because the idea is, okay, you get it wrong the first time, but why would I penalize you if you get it right the second? Uh, there's nothing wrong with that in my mind. Well, would they, and then I would average the grades and what they would do, they would get in groups of three or four and then they would pick the sacrificial lamb who would have to do the first submission and get a lower grade so that then the others could only do the right submission. And every time we had an assignment, they would rotate the first one who would submit. And so I was thinking why basically the person who didn't have many friends and was submitting by themselves would get the lower grade rather than the person who had four friends and they could get together 
and only and like use the fact that there were many and so after trying a couple of semesters how to like how to perfect this method I just decided you know what it's not really worth it and I have to try to find a different way that helps um yeah uh, to find a different way and that's why I decided to eliminate grades altogether and there was a message in the chat is that you can't eliminate grade altogether because the EU requires you to give a grade but so the idea is how do you translate these different approaches into a grade to enter in the system thanks Valentina anything you'd like to add Santiago uh, just briefly, I think saying that I didn't like uh, the dynamic that existed between me and my students of me being kind of an almighty keeper of success. And I, I didn't think that the grading, the traditional grading system that I was implementing was promoting anything but this sort of adversarial, weird, uh, kissing up to the professor, trying to figure out what I was doing and what's my magic to get a grade. That was not really good. And, and it didn't feel good, that dynamic with my students. And with an alternate grading system, it transforms the relationship into something a little bit more relational and putting the goals in their hands, giving them some autonomy to make decisions. So that's been really great about it. Thanks so much, Santiago. Um, that that dovetails perfectly into the next question, which is how do students typically respond to alternative grading methods compared to traditional grading systems? And have you noticed any difference in how students respond to alternative grading? based on student identity, instructor identity, discipline, course sequence, or anything else that you've noticed? And I think we're gonna start with uh, Valentina on this question. Yes, so as a caveat, I will say, as I mentioned before, that I only have one semester of full implementation. So I don't have enough num numbers, enough students gone, has gone through to really make a statistical significant sample. But uh, what I can say is that most of the students in my class responded positively to the labor to the labor based approach and many of them noted that uh, it was less stressful than the traditional grading system um i know like based on their comments which was were actually very very thoughtful and and helpful i'm going to make a number of changes in the next semester uh, but um, what I can say right now is that I saw quite a big difference between the, the lower, the complex problem and the upper level class. And while initially I thought that uh, labor base would work very well for complex problem, but poorly for a, for a specialized upper level science class, it ended up being the opposite. And I don't know if it's because maybe the freshman students are more attached to the idea of uh, getting a grade uh, rather than just learning uh, but um, what happens is that I structure my my class so that they would have to do the assignment during the course of the semester and then they could do some extra labor work uh, to increase their grade and in the complex problem class it ended up that they all did the assignment at the very end mostly between the end of the classes and the finals instead of spacing them during the semester, which was my idea, despite several reminders during the semester. And um, so they waited until the very end. And in the end, they were done pretty poorly because they had to rush. We didn't have time to iterate, like you give me a draft and I give you back some feedback. And then, and so this really kind of defeated the purpose because they would present a poorly made job. There was no time to improve it. And I felt bad not to give them any credit for the poorly made job that they made. So um, I think a lot of this can be solved with a different planning of how I structure my, my system. In the upper level class, I, I did it differently. So I have five in-class assignment and for each assignment, they could do extra labor so that they could increase the grade for that specific assignment. And the assignment were things that would go from motivate their answers, uh, like explain why the wrong answers are wrong uh, or create new exercises or solve additional exercises. Um, and I had several students. So some students, so the deadline for the extra labor was the end of the semester, but many students did it during the semester. A few did it right after the assignment was due which is okay, even though it's not my favorite <laughs> choice, because the idea for me is also that after a while, like in the middle of the semester, they go back to the first assignment, they relook at what we have done and uh, uh, do additional work. And in my thinking, this should give them a better level of understanding because they have already, they're going back to see what we've done before. 
Some students did it during the course of the semester. And yes, the majority still did it toward the end of the semester, but that's kind of what I was expecting. And um, I would say um, no student responded poorly to this. Actually, they were all pretty happy. I asked, I surveyed them specifically about this approach. Um, some of them commented on the kind of extra labor assignment. So they gave, they gave suggestion on how to improve that. Um, Others just said, uh, look, it's my last semester. I didn't really care about getting an A. It wouldn't really change much for me. And so I decided not to do it. But for me, that's a success. That's really the point of it. You have agents in deciding how much effort you want to put. Um, and a lot of them said that they really appreciated it because uh, all the stress was gone in the sense that uh, they had they, they could also could do my assignment collaboratively. So they could submit a lot of time, uh, several times. And then they knew that they had time to improve whatever they had done before. So um, overall, I had much more success with the older students, the upper level students. And I think because they're more open to reflect on their own learning rather than desperately try to get an A because that's what you're supposed to do. Thanks, Valentina. Um, and then I just want to note that uh, Nicole, Nicole, I will, you, you can go first. Um, <laughs> Uh, Nicole put a link in the chat to a um, uh, document from the Eagle, an article from the Eagle about uh, how low income students are harmed by really strict grading policies that we encourage you to read. It's a really great article. Um, and then Scott asked, do you use the term labor based grading in the syllabus? I think people typically do. Um, and I believe Adam shared a link to his syllabus in the chat there. And again, I'll follow up with all of these links and these resources after the session. Um, so you don't necessarily have to keep them all today. Um, but yeah, go ahead, Nicole. Thank you, Mac. And just to say the article in the Eagle that I provided a link to was written by a former student of mine, uh, Greta Mouch, who um, took a course with me that you in a labor-based classroom. And um, so just to kind of give a perspective from, from students, I thought that that was a relevant, uh, appropriate time to put it in the chat. Um, I just want to... Um, this want to say in response to how students have responded to labor-based um, classroom, in my experience, you know, so the first semester I did it, it was a sort of deer in the headlight type of, of reaction, like what it, what, you know, you're doing what in this class? And so I, there was a lot of upfront time in that first class, even that first um, week, kind of um, really making sure that students understood what the objectives were of the course, why we were implementing this approach and what it meant of them, what 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 they were responsible for doing. So what I found was like there was some intimidation at the beginning, but that throughout the semester that um, students kind of uh, they, they got on board with what the system entailed. Now, having said that, that also I've learned over semesters that much of, of getting students to kind of acclimate is to constantly check in with them. And so I frequently use Google Forms, which I'm happy to share with, um, with you all. Um, I can send to Mac to disseminate, where I start off the semester where, you know, I give students a, 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 um, a, a Google Form, which basically asks about themselves, asks them to, you know, look at the syllabus and asks them what their assignments, what work they're going to complete to achieve the grade that they want to achieve in the course. So basically, they at up front are, are taking stock of what they want to earn and, in the group course and what how it is that they're going to go about achieving what they what they hope to achieve. Then I do a sort of second check mid semester where I say, okay, let's go back to what you said at the beginning of the course. Now I want you to look at what you've completed so far and to evaluate where you're at. And then I do the same thing at the end of the course. So sort of throughout the 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 sort of um, approach to learning remains transparent and there's no surprises at the end of the semester, right? So sort of are sort of guided along, reminded of how it is that their labor corresponds to the grade that they're hoping to achieve, um, allowing them to sort of take stock, um, reflect, readapt as needed um, so that they're sort of kind of consistently reminded how it is that the course works and also fully engaged with the process that puts them in charge of their learning and um, yeah, ultimately the grade that they hope to achieve. Thanks, Nicole. Anything from uh, Santiago or Adam? Yeah, let me just throw, I wanted to share one quick thing 
Um, it speaks to this exact question. And uh, well, I'll, I'll give you background first and I'll share it with you. So after my first semester, by and large, by and large is underselling it. Almost literally everybody in my classes has has expressed unprompted um, that they love they love the labor based system, they love the difference, all of that. I had one student my first semester doing it who nonetheless was able to fail a class. I mean like able to fail. It you it feels like you almost have to try in a labor-based class to fail, but yet the student did. And of course it bugged me, right? Like any of us, we, we tend to be like, God, what how did I fail that student in that they failed the class? Right. And that could be unhealthy, but that's how I how I took it. And the student was was an international student from China, one of our Chinese international students. And so I wondered are students from non-traditional AU backgrounds disturbed by this? So, you know, most AU students are second gen or later. They are pri their, uh, primary language is English. Are students from backgrounds other than that disadvantaged by such a system because it's so unfamiliar or, or what have you? So right as I started to have that question, CTRL put out a call for the Sotal Fellowship, which I was lucky enough to get. And they helped me spend two years looking into this to try and figure out was there a different experience for different students in the class, which goes right to this question. So um, what I wanted to do very quickly is just show you part of, of this presentation I gave, and I can, I'm can i happy to send the link out um, to the entire presentation. This was another CTRL um, presentation, but this was digesting uh, the a poll that I did for students after the class had ended to see what they thought. And just, just really quick to go through these, you can see um, the slides are broken down by generation responses and then by primary language uh, users' responses. And I, on the great advice of Lacey Wooten, the very recently former director of, of writing studies, I changed the like the valence of the questions, right? So that it wasn't, they were all positively worded. So students had to stop and think about it. So this was the first question. Did students find it easy to understand and you can see that overwhelmingly, um, both cohorts found it easy to understand. That 3.4 or 5%, that was one person that, that was an outlier um, of, the, of the numbers. But overwhelmingly, this is who found it easy to understand. When you go into language, uh, the same thing holds. Uh, it was either agree or strongly agree. This was a switch of it because many of my colleagues wondered, look, if they're in a labor-based course, is it going to make them um, deprioritize your own work. And I will say that by and large, I have found that there, there is a truism to that. The upside, and this kind of goes with what Valentina was saying earlier, I know that that happened because the students would, in a conversation, in office hours with them, in meetings with them, they would tell me, which meant that they were comfortable enough with me to share what's going on with them and their coursework. It also meant that they knew what they were doing and why. Right, that they they could peel back like, look, I, I like what I'm doing for your class, but I had to uh, turn your thing in late because my other class, you know, would have been this massive uh, point deduction on my my final project or whatever. Like, they're making rational decisions that the poisonous system has taught them to make. So I don't begrudge them at all. All that said, nonetheless, um, you can see the vast majority of both cohorts uh, disagreed with the idea that they put less importance on my my course's work in a labor-based system. Uh, and this is for the language speakers, and the same thing holds. Uh, the next question I asked um, was about, do I think they've written better papers in a traditional class, which I was really curious about. Um, Second gen had uh, about 17% said, oh yeah, maybe they would have written better papers in a class that used the external motivation. Um, but everybody else was on board. And I thought this was interesting. This is one of the, the big differences between cohorts. First generation students, all of them disagreed with that, either strongly or just traditionally disagreed that they would have written better papers, which helped kind of assuage my, my original fear that students from non-AU traditional, non-traditional AU backgrounds were getting disturbed by it. Um, this is the, the language cohort. Uh, those numbers are relatively high because I think there was one or two and that led to those higher ones, but still nonetheless, 80% uh, um, to 90% or 88% for the top one. This one for me is the most important. I felt less anxiety about this than other courses. Um, second gen, almost 100%. And in first gen, every respondent picked strongly agree. And that to me, maybe more than any other number is the most important. Um, if students can be in the best headspace possible, 
they have a chance of being in the best learning space possible. And this tells me the, the, the course structure was helping get them there. Um, and this was for the uh, primary language. Again, I had fewer users so that 80% primary and the 20%, it was actually just down to like one or two <laughs> outliers there. Um, and then lastly, would they want to take a course again? Uh, every cohort agreed or strongly agreed. Um, both language, both uh, collegiate experience. So I, I, I hope that kind of gives you a taste. And again, there's a longer presentation that, that explains even more of the methodology, all that kind of stuff. Um, but yeah, I just wanted to share that all with you. Thanks so much, Adam. I think you're, uh, that data is very appealing to me as a scientist, so maybe to our fellow scientists. Um, and I think it's really strong and positive. And um, I, I can definitely make sure to share that out with folks. Um, I think in the interest of time, we'll move on to uh, our next question, which is, um, as you reflected on your alternative grading policies, what challenges did you face or mistakes did you make? What have you learned from them and how has it improved your course? And I believe we're starting with uh, Adam on this question as well. Yeah, and I'll try not to talk so much. I get so excited. Um, so I'll, I'll keep this super nice and concrete. Late, late papers, late exercises, what do we do about them? Um, my thinking is still evolving and going on this, but I wasn't alone, I think, in, in COVID really helping relax the way we treated late things. And in doing that, I think I know that I swung too far in letting late things go. Um, and so after having just a, a, a basically a wildly lax, like, you know what, just get it in. We'll take care of it. Please don't stress. Don't stress. Just get it in. Um, I realized by talking to students, everything should come down to students and their responses, that they need a little nudging right? They, they don't want the whip of an external motivation. That's just this, this wildly punitive thing, but they need, they need just the right thing. And this is what I'm trying to tweak. So where I've landed now, and this was after I put up a, um, I could probably find the link for you too, if you're interested, but I put up a link to a question. I asked students to read an article about late policies that was like in higher ed or something. And I said, what do you all think I should do about late penalties? Should there be any, should there be some, like, how do you want it? And the, the majority of responses said, there should be something. I know myself, if I don't have a deadline, if I don't have a little spur, I, I just put things off and become, it, it backs up and it gets in the way. Um, and so hearing students say that they wanted something meant, the, meant all right, I need to take it seriously um, and start doing it. And so my current, and, and if anyone looks at my syllabus and you're welcome, by the way, to, and all my materials anytime, um, where I am now is I have capped out the, um, the impact of late exercises on a student's final grade so that you cannot fail my class only because you had too many late things. So I have a little chart, which many of us have, and, and the Sal in no way is, is sort of one of the people I got this from. But one of the things that, that determines where that B goes, you're guaranteed to be um, unless you know there's late things or missing things, essentially. At five or six, I, I forget where I am. At five or six, anything above that is just, is, you're just capped at a C. You can't do better than a C. But I didn't want to say you're going to fail this class. And that for me was um, a mistake that I had done and being too lax. And right now, I think I'm, I'm at an okay place. Students, I've, I've run it for one year with this new thing. They seem to like it. The idea that there's a bit of a nudge, but it's not a make or break ultimately nudge. Um, I might have something new in a year. Let's keep talking, but that that's something that I learned. Thanks, Adam. Uh, Santiago, do you wanna jump in here since uh, you didn't get to respond to the last question? Sure, thank you, uh, Mac. Um, interesting, um, I'm also like Adam in the sense that I am not a gradual implementer. So when I first learned about this, I went all in and I completely upended my course um, and it was crazy. Uh, so I think that over the years and the iterations of, of uh, versions of the course that I've had, I think that one of the lessons I've learned is that simplicity is key. But ultimately for the instructor, like we we definitely want to do good for the students. We have the best commitment to try to figure out how to give them autonomy, make him be self-reflective learners, support them in the process of learning, retain him in our courses. But there's also a point of diminishing return I learned when I was doing so much work in my alternative structure and giving him so many opportunities uh, the qualifier here is that I don't use labor-based grading by mastery-based grading and specs grading. That's kind of my, my area. 
And by doing that, it became too much. So I had to peel back. And over the years, it's become a lot more simplified, where I feel like I've finally arrived to a place where there's a good balance between student success and also sanity for me, which is also part of the initial reason why I became, I wanted to go alternative grading practices. I was doing too much work and not getting a lot of conversation with the students. I think that um, just kind of wanted to make a point a little bit on the stuff from before that I think we all have to, uh, unlike maybe the labor grade, grading system in mastery-based grading, specs grading, I've received a lot of pushback from students. So I think students that are very conditioned to working within the grading structure that they get points for doing whatever, not necessarily anything at proficiency level, students buck against that, right? When you come back and say, sorry, try it again, that's not necessarily something comfortable for them. So by staying strong and continuing to have conversations with them and trying to educate them and uncondition some of the practices that they've done for so many years, eventually this ends up being very successful. I've had a really good success with student retention, um, uh, students from marginalized groups uh, performing much better and people that are uh, initially interested in leaving STEM because they had no opportunity to succeed are hopefully staying because I'm giving them chances and providing opportunities for them to demonstrate that they actually belong in the STEM areas. Um, yeah. Thanks, Santiago. Um, I love that that feeling of belonging in STEM. It's, a, it's hard to get and uh, it's really key to continue uh, fostering. Um, all right, I think in the interest of time, we'll move to our final question, just so we have time for our uh, uh, audiences to also, audience, not audiences, audience to also ask questions. Um, so our final question today is, uh, what advice do you have for fellow faculty members who are interested in implementing alternative grading, but maybe are hesitant to take that first step? Are there any particularly helpful resources you would recommend? Um, and Santiago, you're starting us out on uh, this first question. Yeah, thank you, Mark. Thanks, I, thanks to everybody. So um, I think it's a little bit difficult in this particular forum, and I think the CTRL has done a fantastic job gathering some resources for all of you. But I would say that starting with the literature, of course, it's, it's a really good way to get going, right? So there's a lot of people now that over the years, uh, over the past decade, I think there's a lot of people now have begun to implement some of these alternative grading practices, figuring out which way do you want to go, whether it's labor-based grading, mastery-based grading, specs grading, or some sort of combination of them all, which is where I ended up with a little bit of things from here and there is, is a way to go. I think that it's important for us as a lesson to not stay too disciplinary. The project that I developed initially on alternative grading was developed in collaboration with an economist. So we had nothing to do with one another from a discipline perspective, but the inspiration and philosophy behind grading and thinking alternatively about grading was universal for both of us. So it's beautiful that we have a collection of individuals here with various disciplines. And I think that's important to not get stuck in the idea that maybe I'm not as helpful to a person doing literature or sociology or something like that and the other way around as well. I think that that interdisciplinary actually helps us. Uh, I think uh, one qualifier I would say is that as a suggestion is that a change in your grading structure ultimately will not be just a tactic, meaning that you're not just changing a tiny little bit and then everything's gonna stay kind of the same. You will soon realize when you get into the systems that it becomes a strategy change. So you really are rethinking the meaning of grades, why grades matter, and what consistency do you want to have between the grades that you assign and the students that get out of your class with a particular grade. That became key to me, is recognizing that I needed to sort of undo a few of the structures in my course, starting with the learning outcomes, and then moving into grading structures to begin to really um, embrace uh, the system of alternative grading. That is not to say that there's no path for people doing incremental changes or maybe assignments that can change. I think that that's perfectly fine. But uh, as I said at the beginning, once you start undoing some of those things, a lot more things will fall into place. Um, I think working with colleagues that have done it is, is essential. I think that uh, I speak for myself, but I'm certainly happy to work with people as they do implementation. It's lonely out there sometimes when you're in the middle of a system change and then your students are no longer happy with you and they're kind of bucking against it and you're kind of second guessing whether you're doing it right. Having the person or the people next to you that are going to be telling you that's normal, that's a normal feeling, or yes, that's a big bump that I always hit. Like It's nice to have a partner in the process of implementation. So absolutely think of people doing this as resources. Um, uh, and finally, um, yeah, like I think that you have to have a heart-to-heart -heart with 
uh, when you're thinking about alternative grading with what is it that you actually want to teach? And that starts with looking at learning outcomes. So the idea of backwards design comes into play when it comes to implementing alternative grading systems, as well as taxonomies of learning was something that was my gateway uh, um, mechanism into getting into this by thinking specifically about what goes in my class, what do I actually want to teach in my class, and eventually then how am I going to assess that was an initial essential step for me to get there. So starting with some of the literature potentially on backwards design and, and learning outcomes and things like that was also very useful because a lot of the alternative grading systems use learning outcomes as the center of how you provide feedback for students, and, and that's kind of an interesting starting point. I hope that was helpful, but lots to talk about with all of you, and I'm available anytime to talk to people about it. I wasn't letting me unmute. Thank you. Um, thanks for starting us off there. Uh, who else wants to jump in here? I'll just say very quickly, I dropped a couple of books into the chat that are, I think, great ones. Ungrading by Susan Bloom is becoming like one of the standard Bibles of it. Um, it's, a, it's a great collection that gets you going. And the other just came out, but there's a great blog that these two guys run, Grading for Growth which I highly recommend. Um, and then I want you all to know, like I said in the chat, we uh, we have a Canvas group, AU Alternative Grading, I think we call it, or something like that. But it's just, a, it's a community of us to share questions, resources, and things. Anyone is welcome to join. The more that we have in there, commenting, wondering, the better. So you can just let me know that you want to be part of it. I will just add you. Um, you can lurk, you can participate. Um, everybody welcome. Thanks, Adam. Uh, Nicole or Valentina? I don't have much more to add. That, I mean, I, I do, but then I'll go on forever. But I think that everything that was said here was um, was excellent. And yes, I also invite people into the community of uh, that we, you know, it's growing. So to share practices. Maybe one, um, one comment, uh, one suggestion I can make uh, learning from my own mistake is that to be really, really, really specific on what you consider um, being the, the minimum acceptable, acceptable standard of, of work. So if you, and if you think that something is not enough to count as labor, then you have to specify it in advance. Um, because that is a bit of the, of the problem. That was actually a large portion of the problem that I had with my complex problem class is that while I gave for granted that uh, a poster would be something, the students thought about something else. While I gave for granted that an Instagram story would be something, they thought about something else. And so you really need to be specific. Um, and the other comment I wanna make is that, go back to what Santiago uh, answered, is that it was so much work for me this past semester. So in the next iteration, I'm definitely gonna simplify. Um, I'm, I might um, get more, more elements of the specification grading, but like I'm gonna simplify how this whole grading system went because what happened during the semester is that uh, um, I kept getting all this random extra labor assignment that I had to, to look at at any moment. So I couldn't really plan my, my when to give feedback and the time to dedicate to teaching and research because all these assignments are coming in. And uh, uh, there was a lot of them, which was too many. So in order to make it simpler for them, but especially for me and maintain my sanity during the semester, I'm definitely gonna sim simplify how the extra labor can be done um, because it was really a lot of work. <laughs> Thanks, Valentina. Um, so now I'm, we... I'm sorry, An oh, another sorry. really quick comment is that sorry, sorry, sorry. the other reason why it was a lot of work is that not having any more the grade, I felt like I had to give a much more, a much deeper and informed feedback. So before with the grading, I had my rubric and I would select the criteria for the rubric and that would solve giving a lot of feedback. It was a kind of a simplified and insufficient feedback, but the students wouldn't look at it anyhow. But now I felt like I don't have this grade, I don't have this rubric, so I really have to go more in details. And that takes so much more time, took so much more of my time. So that's it, I'm done now. <laughs> Thanks, Valentina. Uh, sorry for jumping in there. Um, so thank you all so much for your responses. I think a lot of really great things have been brought up. 
Um, so to our uh, participants, um, we're going to move into like the portion where you all can ask questions. So we've gotten some questions in the chat and a few have been responded to. Um, so I'm going to pull out one of the ones that um, that I saw. So maybe we can start there and then uh, other folks can put questions in the chat or feel free to raise your hand um, and I'll call on you kind of in the order uh, that we get those questions. So the first question that I saw that wasn't yet addressed, and if your question wasn't addressed, please just uh, send it again, um, is what might it look like to combine labor-based and spec-based grading? For instance, formative assignments according to a labor-based system, but larger or final assessments according to specs. And I just recopied it into the chat to put uh, here so that you all can reference it back. Um, and who, yeah, Nicole, go ahead. Mac, I can start with that. I, I um, And it's probably because I just... <laughs> kind of realized that I was doing a sort of form of specs-based grading in my labor-based classroom. So I, I'll I'll speak to kind of one way I handle it. So as part of the contract um, in my in, in my classroom, students have to complete, you know, what one, you know, some of the assignments they have to complete is what I call course assignments, which is, which is when I kind of give a prompt that they have to respond to. Um, or, you know, there's also kind of other projects as well. But because I don't assign a, a grade, what I do when students, uh, what I do um, with those assignments is put a very heavy um, emphasis on revision. So when I evaluate the student work, I give a lot of comments, um, you know, sort of that, you know, you could sort of add annotated comments in Canvas. And I also have a very simple rubric whereby I look at the prompt that I gave the students and I, and I, uh, you know, and I mark whether or not their response to the prompt met expectations or did not meet expectations. So for example, if the prompt asks them to sort of interpret a population pyramid um, to look at, you know, changes in birth or death rates over time, you know, whether or not they can do that or not will meet expectations or not. Um, and if they don't meet expectations, part of the revision is for them to respond to my questions about, about um, you know, about their response. So, so much of the evaluation is based on, again, on their responses to my question. And then in that revision, um, you know, the expectation is that they'll move from having met, ex not have met expectations in that area to having met them in a, in a, in a revision. So I don't know if that um, answers the question, but I think the emphasis on revision and completion in the labor-based classroom integrates a specs-based approach. So they have to complete the assignment for the labor to count, but there's a specs-based kind of um, you know um, evaluation built into that that's about whether or not their responses are kind of, are meeting those expectations or not. I hope that helped um, answer. But again, I could also share my resources as well if helpful. I think I'll probably, if, and if you all are comfortable, I will, uh, and I, I saw that Adam and, and Valentina already shared their syllabi, uh, but maybe I'll ask for you all to share those and then I can share those out as a resource afterwards. Um, any other uh, responses to this, to this question? Any, anything that anybody else wants to add about combining labor-based and spec-based grading? I mean, I'll just say that, that when that question came up, Hannah, it was this is the very thing that that I'm working on figuring out because I want to make sure that students keep that 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 anxiety level, right? That less anxiety about the course, but also that that I'm helping them see their own progress, which can be one of the weird trade-offs that that it's it's I mean, it is it's a lot of work. Yeah, but it's a lot of good work, right? Where like in the old days, when I used to grade stacks of paper that kids would just look for the grade on, that was a lot of work that wasn't useful on my part, right? The kids want to read it, they wouldn't digest it. Um, this work of trying to figure out how do I get students to learn, to see their learning in a way that is not the poisonous system they've been brought up in, uh, it can be hard and challenging and requires constant revision, but it's it's deeply rewarding because you feel like you're doing everything with the student's best interest in mind. And I'll just add, with your own, um, there's a real delight to being in the system and realizing that you're giving feedback just because it's feedback, not because you're justifying a grade. That's a switch that I didn't anticipate until I did my first paper in ungrading. And it it's a game changer to feel that way about in, uh, interacting with students like Santiago was talking about. It changes the entire tenor of your relationship. It's wonderful. Any final thoughts on this question? 
All right. So the next question that I see is um, from Natasha Coco Benitez, which is, did anyone use student work from a previous semester anonymously to show what an A or B could look like? Was that a useful strategy? And anybody can feel free to start. Um, I I do. I generally do. Um, I don't think, at least I, I, in my complex problem, I I don't do like papers or essay in my upper level. But um, I do, and I say this is well done. I sometimes do it also. Uh, people in the same in the same class, like we do an assignment, the first paper, and then I share the one that I thought were best. Also, maybe they're not perfect, so I also share my feedback with it. And then um, without saying who, who made it. And then so that the, for the next one, they have a better idea of what it was. Um, I'm not sure they actually read it because nobody has ever commented on it, but I, I do share it. Are there things we want to add? Well, this was in the chat, but just as, as a quick sort of appendix to that, um, showing students their own peers work is is wildly beneficial right no matter the the class not just writing but also complex problems other other disciplines um but the the, the note of of sort of warning i put in there is you know i, I would be skeptical of of naming it as here's an a paper here's a b paper because that suggests that you're still coming at it from um a metric that if, if we kept interrogating well, what's your metric for why is it an a paper there might be really good reasons, in which case lead with the reasons. Why is it successful? Or it might get back to like in writing studies, uh, some problematic use of, of white supremacy, like as your as your metric, like, oh, this is really well written. Well, what does that mean? Well written according to whose languaging. Um, and so if instead it's this great opportunity to say, look, here's a student who did really well in this. Here's why I think it went well. What do you all think about? Where do you see successes? And, and to Valentina's point, um, they get a lot out of also seeing, well, where do you think this could have been stronger? Um, so one of the things I do that you may think of in my writing studies class, uh, one of their extra labors they can do, and, and if you've looked at my syllabus, you'll see I've got extra labors. They present on their revision, and my students love this because the presentation is a student saying, oh, here's what I did in my first thing. Like, say, it's, a, it's an album review for my Tanasi Coast class. Here's, here's what I did in my album review. Here's what PT said in his feedback. Uh, he and I met in office hours. We talked about this. So here's what I did in my revision. And having them publicly sort of wrestle with what went on in the first version, what they thought about, how they, they solved problems that came up, that's a great use of, of their own work with their peers. Thanks, Adam. Um, I think in the interest of time, we'll move to another question that we got. So um, Allison Stimler asks, can you give any guidance on how to translate the labor requirements into grades on Canvas? And are there resources that you all have to help with this? I'll be very quick about this. So the, the way that I've pulled this out with labor base is everything is either complete or incomplete uh, with zero points. And the thing that's the downside is that Canvas has no idea how to use that and still tell students percentages. And so, uh, like, if you see, like, you know, many of us have a chart of how many late, how many missing, what your final grade would be. It's nice and straightforward, but if a student logs in and Canvas is like 92%, well, it doesn't mark that some of them were late, and so it'd be different. And so um, it does, like, everything. You have to explain it to students. But I have found that once you, you get into setting up an assignment with zero points, complete or incomplete, uh, that that for me has done the job because then when you you have a student click on grades, it will run down and it will show them turned in, late or missing, which is my chart language basically. Um, and so Canvas can help in that respect, but you have to tell them ignore the percentages. Yeah, and if I can add to that, because um, I as well place a heavy emphasis on resubmission and revision, an assignment in Canvas will remain incomplete until the student actually, you know, um, meets the requirements for the assignment, at which point the incomplete becomes the complete. So they can kind of track their progress in Canvas um, as to, you know, how they're, how they're fulfilling labor requirements in terms of how many, you know, assignments they see are completed and remain outstanding. I had a, a lot of troubles with this. Like that was maybe the main complaint that it was difficult for them to understand where they stood. 
So I'm probably going to pick up Nicole and Adam approach, like complete and incomplete. I think one way, my, how I structure my labor assessment, one way is to, instead of using percent, using points, and then make it such so that if they, all the required labor adds up to 85 points. And then any extra labor is an additional, I don't know how much, five points, for instance. Um, so it needs, I need to do some math if I want to use this approach to figure that out, uh, because generally I don't go by points, I go by percent. But I think that going by points would solve that. But uh, Nicole and Adam's approach of complete and incomplete might be better. Thanks, Valentina. Um, I just want to jump in here with one strategy that I've seen. Actually, I believe that Grading for Growth newsletter shared it, um, which is a strategy that you can use earlier in the semester if you're worried about this, is giving students, for example, like, okay, so you turn in 10, 10 discussion board assignments, five of which are late, and then you have them assign their grade based on the outline that you have in your syllabus. So it gets them that practice at okay, this is what this actually means. This is how I can calculate my own grade. And then they get a little bit more familiar with those requirements. So that's that's another option that you could think about. I think what you have hopefully gotten from this panel today is that there are so many options, which again, can be overwhelming uh, because there are a lot of options. And I think a lot of us are combining and incorporating multiple different types of alternative grading. So that specs grading, the mastery based, um, uh, labor-based. So you hear all of these terms and what's really great about alternative grading that our panelists have mentioned is that you can pull from what you like and leave behind what doesn't work for you. So you really do get to develop that own system that's really personalized to your pedagogy, your students, and your course. All right, so I think those are the questions that we have. Um, are there any final questions that folks would like to um, Okay, uh, we got one one last from Alyssa, Alyssa Harbin. Um, is there a major difference between specs-based grading and rubric-based grading? And typically, typically in specs-based grading, the the criteria for specifications that you provide for students is significantly more simplified than an overall rubric instead of having like multiple layers of like proficiency and degrading quality of work you kind of have a um a, a one scale of what is required to score a d what is required to score a c and then moving up from there i tell my students that's kind of a build up scale and the beauty of that structure is that at any point, when I give feedback, for example, on lab reports or on writing assignments, my students, if they don't meet the criteria for the C level, I provide them feedback for everything on the D and then I stop and I say, hey, you don't meet the criteria for the C in the resubmission. Now you need to address anything from C forward. So it also uh, saves up a lot of time in terms of trying to provide feedback for things that are not there necessarily, right? So if you didn't necessarily include a particular component, according to the specs, simply it doesn't qualify for that grading level. And then I stop grading there and then I move on to, okay, here's here's back to you and now give it back to me when you have it ready to go at the different spec. So to me, it, it simplifies it a lot more. Um, um, that's that's been that's been sort of my experience. Uh, the criteria is a little bit more clear, but not not I mean not so different. If you're used to doing rubrics, turning it into a specs rubric, uh, it, a specs uh, criteria is, is, is definitely uh, a good start. All right, so I think those are all of our questions that we got um, from the chat. Uh, and then folks, participants, um, are there any other questions that you all would like to ask either in the chat or via raising your hands? So I'm going to go ahead and share just our final reflection question. And this is a question for our participants to either think about, or you can feel free to share your response in the chat if you'd like. And it is, which alternative grading system would you like to learn more about, or do you think would work best for your courses? And so think about that. Um, feel free to respond in the chat or just kind of leave with that question uh, as you go throughout your day. Um, so I will thank our panelists uh, one last time. 
uh, you all did great. And I think uh, we got some really, really powerful uh, strategies and suggestions from you all. Um, and hopefully a lot, lots and lots and lots of resources. Um, and I will follow up with you all to get those, uh, get the links to those guys. Um, John Jones would like to know more about all of them, <laughs> which I think is, is pretty solid. Got some blends of specs and labor base. Lots, I think lots to learn, um, lots of spaces to go, and hopefully you all have a path forward for learning more about uh, the strategies that we've talked about today. And again, that uh, resource that I shared at the beginning, but I'll share again uh, here, uh, outlines some of the details about uh, these various alternative training practices. So with that, we're done about five minutes early. Um, I think Victoria has a uh, an evaluation uh, link that, to share in the chat. Mac, can Nicole, I, yeah. I just ahead. want to say one quick thing for those of you who are thinking about this, but are probably, you know, understandably really afraid to do it. After, um, after the presentation, the CTRL presentation that Adam gave in December, I said to him, I was so intrigued. I said to myself, if I don't do this right now, I'm never going to do it. It's fresh in my mind. I'm motivated. Like um, I'm, I'm intrigued. I'm so over the dread of grading that I just devoted. I think, I mean, I, this sounds absurd to say, but I think I probably devoted a, a, a week because I know everyone's so busy, but a week where I said, I'm going to sit with my syllabus and I'm going to read some of the materials that I, I had from the presentation and I'm going to do what I can to create a new syllabus. I had a colleague of mine in my department who also attended Adam's talk, did the same thing. And we were sort of partners in crime, sharing, you know, syllabi, asking each other how each one sounded. And so I just want to urge all of you, I know it's intimidating, but I'm with Santiago and Adam in terms of sort of diving right in. So if that is you and your personality, I would strongly recommend jumping in now, taking the plunge and yeah, just going for it. You're all learners as much as you are instructors in this process and you'll continue to be. So I wish you all luck. And yeah, if I can be of, of help or assistance in any way, I'm really happy to, to be that for you. So thank you. Yeah, I just want to say ditto. Uh, if you want to jump in with somebody holding your hand, I'm we're delighted to do that. If you just want to talk through stuff, bounce ideas off, um, you're not alone. And I think one of the great things about the community has been seeing that more and more people um, are doing this. We, we met a guy that's been doing it at AU for decades. And he's like, I didn't think anyone else was doing this. I didn't think anyone could do this publicly. And so it's like, we're like, we're coming out of the shadows, everybody. What we do in the shadows is no longer shadowy. Um, most of it. <laughs> Can I ask the silly question? How does a canvas group work is that like a facebook group where there's like posting and responding i've never used canvas that way yeah yeah so it's like an easy way to send emails out to everyone it's an easy place just to upload materials um and have like discussion discussion board things like um what are you all doing about late things what are you all doing about absences we're doing about ai and um yeah I, but it is organized as a class right so you have the discussion boards you can send out emails. So it's like a Canvas class, but it's us. <laughs> so it shows up in, in our Canvas as a as a class that we're a member of. Should now, yeah. yeah. All of the couple of you that have emailed me, I've added you all, you're there. Um, I add everybody as teachers. So you have complete functionality because we are a team of equals. So why should I be the only teacher? Um, so it, it should be just like one of your Canvas classes. Um, you, I don't know if you have to move it up or not to that favorite thing, but it, it will be there when you go to Canvas. If it's not, in your, your top one, look at all courses um, and see if it's there. Great, thank you. All right, well, thank you all, everyone. Um, just noting again that Victoria put that uh, eval link in the, uh, in the chat. So if you do have a time to uh, review that, uh, or if you do that, uh, respond to that, um, that would be great. We really value your feedback. And I will follow up uh, at some point, likely tomorrow, uh, with, with all of these resources.